corn farmers to get to the right program, making sure they get into uh, the one that has the best fit so they can, you know, be in the right program that helps them implement the most conservation practices. So, so uh, the figure I remember from a, uh, another report somewhere along the line was I think something like 30,000 <coughs> acres in cover crops. Does that sound good? Well, keep going. We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we skip to those pages? So. Can I ask a quick question? Well, I'll leave it as a different one before we leave this chart. Yeah. FAPs. I was a meeting, you know, and asked him about the FAPs. I think the, the, the limit, the, the amount you can get as a grant, I think, is $5,000. $5,000. So, and that's an internal agency policy that yeah. we made. And we've had some feedback. We actually um, just had some discussions at the Nutrient Management Commission on that. Um, we did that on, intentionally. We wanted to make sure that multiple farmers got access to stuff um, because it's a very small, it's $150,000. It's a very small pot of money. Um, and we tend to roll over any monies that we can, can into that and expand it. But um, originally that program was near a half a million dollars and over the years has kind of dwindled. Um, so we, we put that restriction in to make sure that there was some equity and you know, one or two farms should not just gobble it up. So the farmers that were at the meeting were saying, well, it's been that figure for something like 15 years. We haven't had a program for that long, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I was hearing. And so it, it never went up, and it, it, well, the price of everything's gone up. Uh, when you check in with ABC of Agriculture about re moving that limit, so I'm guessing you're, since the, they explained that you're not inclined to do that because the pot of money's got small. Well, and, and we'll see where the future goes. I mean, everything changes so quickly year to year, and right now we're in a phase where there's some additional federal resources coming through. Um, Senator Leahy was able to, there was a appropriation that um, went through the basic program through DEC to us, so we all worked to write all this paperwork to move this money um, to give us additional funds to put in this program this year. That could be one year program, it could be two years, it could be over, I don't know. So to change the entire program right now, it's not a stable, source of money, but it is allowing us to at least give more grants out to folks. Um, because there is more demand than we actually have resources for in that sure. Um My question is more about the next page, but before we skip ahead, I'd like to address them just keep close. Or this one right here. Inspection enforcement. Yeah, the inspection enforcement. I've noticed that the percentage of enforcement actions for your inspections is almost doubled in three years from 10% of inspections were getting enforcement actions to now about 18%. Can you, one, speak to that, um, and then I'll have a follow-up question as well. But. Sure. So one easy thing to think about is, um, well, so we have a lot more staff. We had four people, now we have 10, right. really 11. Uh, that's a big change. So there are more you know, police on the road paying attention. And the some of the changes, so a large farm, if you consider a large farm, farm could be anywhere from five farmsteads to like nine farmsteads, I think is the, the largest one that we have as far as the number of farmsteads. What we had in the past was one person managing that program and they would, the charge in statute is to annually inspect. It wasn't more detailed than that and what we had capacity for was to go to a farmstead a year. So if you had nine farmsteads and we only went to That's one, it's, it's a farm. <laughs> so but you may how have can a farm be five farmsteads because they, have they buy five other farm locations. Okay. So yeah. what is a farmstead? It is a, a place where there's a definition. So how do you <laughs> distinguish between a farm that has five five farmsteads? Because globally we permit all of these farms, which I'm calling farmsteads. That's a term we've had to use so that we can have good nomenclature internally to be able to speak about things. But it is essentially, if you think about, you know, if you were to pick all these farms and have them under one ownership. And so heifers may be here, um, a manure pit may be just there, and the actual home farm where the milking herd may be in another space, right? So collectively, all of the different farms. Okay, I got 10,000, and the center from Franklin has 8,000. You were okay. two separate farmsteads, not a farm together. Okay. And we're two farms. We're two farms. But if I own the farm, farm in St. Albans and our farm in Enosburg, so the you have uh, two, farm. two farms. The Senator from Franklin asked you what your inspections were, and you get the number. So number. No, I'm just wondering why the. I mean, I, I get you've had inspections, but I would assume that you'd have the same percentage of enforcement actions. So the change is, is now we're going to. Enforcement everyone. actions are. Yeah. So we're going um, to inspections. It's also more farms. Farms, farms like yours it's also or more farms, farms like mine? It doesn't farms matter. Your it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's so correct. Yeah, it doesn't matter, matter, matter where they are? No, no, no. Let me, no, can I, may I please? Um, so 
Okay. The large farms is an example annually we're there. Now we are at every single farmstead. The so the ability of what you're going to see, for example, if you just go to one a year versus nine a year for that particular farm, the number of inspections. And so but we will call that one inspection for one farm, right? Even though it's really not. So at some level the, the amount of visual and, and on site work is increased significantly. Um, in addition, what also happened was the MFO, medium farm, went, it used to be five year inspection cycles and that changed to three year inspection cycles. So that is up too. So not only are we also going to every facility that might be associated with one medium farm, which we weren't doing before because we didn't have capacity, we are doing that and doing them more often. And then the other piece is, is because we have capacity, we are doing more follow up and other inspections because if you find problems, then you need to go back to make sure that they've been resolved. So just having more people means we're out there more, and so we have more inspections. There are also so, a lot more farms under which, the jurisdiction now that small right. farms are registered. But I get the number of and increased the, inspections, the but the percentage of enforcement is enforcement doubled. Enforcement goes up because you're out there more. Right. So the other question I have, too, is, and I heard this a lot um, talking to most of my farmers this summer and fall, um, and this might be part of a larger conversation, a lot of times they feel that there isn't that these folks aren't there to help them. They know sometimes when they have practices that need help, but they feel sometimes if they were to reach out to this team or to you guys, mm -hmm. that they are more in fear that they're going to get a fine instead of a helping hand saying, hey, thank you for coming to us with these complaints or, or these issues. How do we work together to improve this for everybody? Because we're, you know, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't discourage folks from reaching out to the ag department or to your teams and saying, hey, I know I have this problem. What can I do? How do we build a plan together to fix this over the next three months, six months, year and a half. Um, you know, how would you speak to those concerns? Sure. I mean, it all it all depends on who and what the farm is, right? But the reality is, is the way we used to operate is we used to try and we visit you, we try and hold your hand through everything and get you to the end. You get completely sucked into that um, as far as time to be able to get to the next farm and do the inspection and the statutory statutory requirements that we have to do. So we have relied not only, you know, we've built our engineering team up. We used to have one engineer. Now we've got seven. Um, that's a big difference as far as resource capacity to be able to have help. So there is help for the ag community when they, they reach out and they get it. Um, but our capacity, we also didn't have an enforcement team, right? Now we have three people who are working on enforcement. We used to have one, and they did all of the enforcement for um, carry to gear side as well. But I think their concern is if they reach out for help, they flag the enforcer to come in and, and hit them with an inspection. Well, most, of, most people are getting their inspections already, right? So right. that's helpful because it does make their, you know, there's partners in this room too that are working with farmers. And when we've already been there, it's the, you know, the cop, we've already identified it. So right. the partner can come in more easily and work on it. And so all of these resources that we've provided to the partnership are part of that help package. We also did North Lake contractors. So we put out an RFP and hired people locally in, in the North Lake, which is basically Franklin County, to work directly with farmers. So, and we really did try and focus more on some of these small farms, because we did a North Lake farm survey. So we went to every single livestock farm in Franklin County. We stopped doing um, additional inspections. We just did the core inspections that we needed to do and did the survey so that we would understand, this is in like, I think 2015, 2016, um, what was going on in Franklin County um, as far as in Siskoi, so that we could address the gap watershed and understand everything. And from that, we then hired these contractors. And so we would inspect and then call a contractor and say, can you take this person to the finish line? Because we've got to move on into the, the next farm. And so that's, that program has been going on for a couple of years now, and it works. And you know, I hear farmers saying, I feel like I might get fined, but they're, they're sort of, we categorize how we deal with them. Medium and large farms have been permitted for a number of years now. If we show up and there's a concern, they're likely to go on enforcement. Small farms, we're likely to try and educate them more about what they need and get them into the place, see if they take the steps, come back, and if they're not, then they might end up enforcement. One thing, when I was able to take over enforcement um, a couple of years ago, I started with trying to level it um, in terms of anyone who had not been notified and has a problem gets a corrective action letter, so the warning letter. And then if they don't fix it from there, then it will ramp up. So if they're getting something akin to like a penalty, they've already gotten a warning letter, they've already gotten another notice potentially and have it there. So, it's good to understand the whole picture about how it works, but our goal is obviously we want to fix the problem, right? That's all we're there to do is make sure that the farm has the resources to fix the problem. If we need to use enforcement, we use enforcement because that's our role, right? 
and then the partnership is there and the resources are there. And we're required, if we send them an enforcement action, to tell them all the great things that they should go and find out about as far as resources. But um, I can tell you it's been a tough year for the staff. I mean, to show up on a farm and ask them to do things is very difficult. And yet at the same time, the farms have actually done more than they've ever done. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Right. Yeah, and I just, I guess my point too is I think, and even in your testament here, I want to see less of you guys being the cop and to a word that Senator McDowell doesn't love, but building more of the partnership. Because, I mean, they're critical to my part of the state and the whole state. I'll argue they're the most critical industry in the state of Vermont, and, and they've had four tough years, and we need to work with them um, as they're working towards water quality to meet yeah. their needs. Well, you know, it's on the level. I'm speeder, and I want an 800 number where I can call the state police to get help for the fact that I know 85 miles an hour on Interstate 89. Ever kind of drive on the road. Now, how many calls are we going to get? So, 800 numbers, exact same number. Uh, yeah, so, some, some pollution incidents are so bad that it, it is enforced. So there's no question. Uh, but when a farm has challenges, you know, say buffers or other things, you know, we tend, tend to get to a space where we come up with a plan with them, and then they have to implement it. And, if it, and it's, a, it's a regular rated plan. It's called insurance of discontinuance. Um, and if they follow it, they're good. So we try and work with them. You know, again, our goal, we don't need their money. You know, um, we need their money invested in their farm. Right. And so that is our big picture goal, but it doesn't mean that they can't. They have to be held accountable. I mean, for a billion dollar industry, to have the, the Two penalty. Billion. Wow, yeah. Two or three. I mean, there's a lot of ways to spin it. I would just say billion plus, whatever. To have $69,000 of penalties is, I would say, you know, a very modest total number of dollars ever going to the penalty phase. And at the same meeting I was talking to people about FAPs, they actually were um, wishing there were more penalties brought and more assertive uh, regulation because the LFOs and MFOs that have most invested the most and stepped up the most felt like there were still, um, you know, sort of the bad actor model out there. And that, they were getting a black eye as an industry for, and they felt like they were actually hoping that there would be some very public, high-level enforcement that would encourage those who are maybe not pursuing water quality rules as aggressively as they ought to, to decide that it was time to change practice. So I, I hear it both ways, like uh, both yet that they would want to have you as partners. And also, but they also would like you to be cops sometimes because they feel like there are troublemakers in their neighborhood and they would like that trouble to stop. And, and I would say that I would agree in part, but some troublemakers are just thumbing their nose at regulation and some troublemakers, even though they need to address the problem, are not able to address the problem because they have no money, and so there is a difference there. If you're if you're unable to do something that you're trying and want to do because of financial situation, or if you're just you don't like regulation and your thumb goes out, and that's I think kind of what you're getting at. If there are people that are trying their best, we Some would like help them along, and sometimes. When a police officer pulls you over and gives somebody a warning, it has more of an effect on them behaving than if you gave them a ticket yeah, and you leave them all pissed off at all the cops. And so I yes. think it's a fine balance. It's a balance, and I think we do a really good job at it. And you know, we've been public record requested up the wazoo, so you can ask the partners what they think of what we're doing. Um, but you know, we we referred cases to the attorney general. We referred cases to ANR. Those cases take time. A lot of those cases that are in this list have not gone through those processes. So there is there is a ramp that's still continuing back behind this report that you will see. Um, but I do, I want to be mindful, you yeah. had us on until 9.30 and it's 9.33. Yeah, so um, we'll stop asking questions. So I just, you know, whatever you want out of us, we've got, um, I don't know what highlight you want us to get to um, as far as, you know, we. We're doing everything we said we'd do. The yeah. EPA said in our interim report we're doing everything we should be doing. You know, like I said, in this document, we did strategic planning to restructure ourselves and think about what our goals need to be. 
In this one, it's on page 11, there's five-year non-point source ag goals, which is the other document that starts. 2018, from yeah, one of the year. questions was the three to five-year plan, and this was a five-year plan right. that, um, that was submitted, so. And, and I would argue, you know, so big picture where we are right now, we've got really good rules. We've got some of the stringent, most stringent rules in the country for non-point source pollution. You know, A&R does point source pollution, and they've got their rules pretty well structured as well. Where we're at right now and with the ag community, you know, we've changed the RAPs twice since we started this process with Lake Champlain and Act 64. We're probably going to end up doing it again because we've got to deal with some other things that came up with like the technical service provider certification and those kinds of things. So it's going to be overload for folks. Where we're at right now is we got to focus on the other programs and initiatives that couple along with the regulatory side. And that's where, like for instance, if you're signing up to get a conservation development easement for your farm, you now get an inspection. That's a big shift in the process of how the partnership has operated. And we're looking at farms and thinking, you know, how can we redo silage management in an engineering mindset? How can we reduce the volume of water? You know, so bigger picture thinking about the problem and the source and trying to restructure how we do this on farms. And so we're moving in those directions and you know, working with folks like Nutrient, which um, I think Trey Martin has been talking about in various committees. I'm not sure if he's been here, but you know, we've been working with Stone Environmental for a couple of years on trying to develop models for farms so the farm can go, okay, I need to get to four pounds you know, per acre. What do I gotta do? Plug it all in. Okay, that's my plan. If I follow that, I should go do it and then we can look at the lake and get there. So we've been developing a lot of this, the partner database, all these tools that are sort of coming together. And we've got this plan of getting to a space where the act community has clarity. We really focus and dig in to make sure that the accountability is there and everybody else starts working on the other incentive opportunities that really get to like payments for ecosystem services and start pushing above and beyond. Can I just a two of your last slides here? Cover crop is uh, 26.520 and Slightly down to meet 2017, and then the new rejection papers decline. Um, so, I I don't know if it's a realistic expectation. I would think that we would want to see those numbers keep on going up. But maybe that's not a realistic expectation, or maybe there's a substitute practice. So. There, there, and there's also another storyline as to why it has <coughs> declined. So the, these charts are in here, um, pages. 12 through 15 uh, to describe this. These are solely practices that the Agency of Agriculture and RCS have cost here. So that these are the only acres that we have direct record of payment for installation. And they're meant to show an example of cover crop, conservation crop rotation, and reducing no-till, the significant uptick in adoption um, since Act 64 2015. Yeah. So resources are there, farmers are implementing it. Um, manure injection, NRCS no longer really pays for manure injection, so that's one of the reasons for the decrease through the Capital Equipment Assistance Program and funding manure injection technologies. Uh, we're, like, we're going to likely see that increasing. And then in sub-watersheds where UVM Extension is doing research, uh, as he was shared last Friday, we're seeing significant rates of adoption, you know, up to 38%, I believe is what he was saying, with some conservation farmers in that watershed. So that's, when, when Laura mentioned the partner database, that's how we really want to get to accountability for what farms are implementing without financial assistance. So we can tell that story and show all the work that's happening outside of the financial assistance okay. process. So are you, and then just to make sure I, Hearing this, it, are you saying, for instance, the decline in uh, manure injection acres isn't actual? I mean, because those are the decline in funded acres, but the total acres, people doing it on their own without funding, right. the line would be. Higher. Especially with custom op op yeah. operators. And I don't believe we've taken, these are strictly payments for this practice, right. but we probably need to, we should need to. Um, we've, done the equipment program. We've purchased inject, you know, not the full system because right. it takes the cap, but where that is, they have to report. And so they report at the end of the year. So we would have just gotten the report to see how many acres they did. The trouble is, if I put it on this chart, I don't know how many of the acres actually went through a cost share program. Right. So you could be adding things together that shouldn't be added together. But certainly custom applicators, a lot of them are using injection and they're, they're doing more acres than farmers getting just these payments are doing. More acres than what? Then, then this accounts for. So, my understanding, the money that's flowed into that kind of work, like cover cropping and 
suggestion is that we were sort of priming the pump, right? That they're actually cost effective practices. And so they would be adopted by farmers because they're actually getting cost effective practice. So if we, but to help someone make the transition or experiment with it or get started, that was why we were putting money in. So is, was that, is that played out that way? That people said, oh, now that I've, I got help to get started, now that I see it, I'm only put my own money in because it's a cost effective practice. Well, so a good example is no-till, right? That, you're seeing manure injection on a lot of that land uh -huh. because that, they're trying not to disturb the soil. So farmers, you know, they, you've gone to enough meetings to, to hear them say, like, we just had this piece of equipment in our community or this technical assistance, and you've watched Extension and all of those folks work with everyone. That is the change that is happening. And the farmers are actually the ones doing more of the demonstration and site testing, and then being able to share with each other and adopt it. Again, it's a social change. The government can help where we can, but it is the farmers, and they are driving it right now. And we are providing and trying to figure out the right places to put the resources that are available to be able to continue on that launch. But it's happening. Um, I think you'll see it increase. And seeing these investments in a time of very low, uh, low prices and you know, farm pay prices just you know, speaks to the, I think, the commitment where these are good practices and uh, financial assistance does help. But you know, many folks are, uh, from hearing it, adopting and implementing more than the caps for either the, the state program or that they may have through the NRCS equal program. It's a new area we definitely are digging into is how do we make sure that they did it well enough that it should count towards, like it, it meets the same standards as the cost share programs. And that's where we're working on um, with DEC a quality assurance plan and then the partners to be able to get that data into this database so that if, if a partner is working with a farmer and the farmer tells them what they did, they can put it into this database and check it and make sure that it meets the quality assurance that we're looking for. Um, so if we're looking out another two, three, four, five years, whatever, um, you all took on staff, more staff a few years back to help pick up the pace. You, um, is it your sense that ag could or should have uh, additional staff still in order to continue that development of those kinds of practices? I would say at this point, so I've got two more positions that I'm trying to get through joint fiscal, through having federal money, um, no state money involved in those positions, so they're, they're interim positions. Um, one's an engineer and one's a prep position, so to work on the buffers. Um, I think that we're in a good space. However, if, if, for instance, the legislature came out and said, we're going to increase a lot more money, right? You've got to try and pair that with the staffing resources that it takes to move that money. So where we're at today with the budget that we have, I think we're in a really nice space. And you know, I think we did a really good job. We could have gone bigger, certainly. Um, but we, we, each year, we came in with a little bit more instead of going all at once. Um, and I think it's been really helpful to train the staff and get the partnership and, and get to a space where we are today. So I feel pretty comfortable. Um, the nice part, too, is that the people we hired are incredibly productive. Um, and they're so dedicated, working more than they probably should. Um, I don't want to burn them out. But very fortunate at this moment for what we've been able to build in our agency. I think for this, the legislature in general, in the last couple of years, we've talked about a maintenance of effort. So we all picked up the pace, and now the goal is to at least maintain that level of effort year to year. <clears throat> Probably actually, to be realistic, we should be adjusting for inflation as well. So we don't slip back over time. Yeah, there's always cost of living each year, so the budget has to always account for that. Senator McDonald, last question to you. Uh, approximately what percentage of the newer injection? takes place after dark uh, with the headlights on? I do not know the answer to that. Sorry. You heard of any? No. I, I have heard folks working past dark and spreading manure, but you know, there's no, no idea. Like, what, what's my question? No. Injecting. I was, I actually was, I'm not sure if they were broadcasting or injecting, but they were working long days to get it done. Uh, I'm talking about you know, broadcasting and spraying. I'm talking about injecting. So, so for injection and the equipment that the agency has bought, one of the things that's required with it is a flow meter and a data logger so that you can know how much manure went in. I just visited uh, North Dakota during planting season. They're, the drivers are out till 24 hours a day because they want to get the use of their equipment in a timely fashion. I wonder whether the injecting, which is the preferred method, is being using all the time or it's 
just until the daylight activity. I think that you know there's there's windows of opportunity, and what I've seen is especially if there's good weather and there's staff and resources, farmers will work late. They will. So you know, I, I don't think you can inside. assume anything about that other than making the best of the opportunity that they have. Between the North Dakota and what I see here in Vermont is night and day. Well, thank you. And obviously, thank you we have volumes of stuff we can share with you over time as we go through this wonderful great session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can invite um, Mr. Ace to join us. Yeah. We'll probably do it in person. Oh, you want to? Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, however, if you want, if you want to, I might call it together. That's just my turn. Put it on. Whatever works. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Around us, I think that's the top of the That's the main. And this is the main. And these uh, people want to. There's three pages. Oh, that's so much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jill Arachi. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts. I'm Carrie O'Brien. I'm the district manager for the Caledonia County Conservation District, and I serve uh, as administrator of the State Natural Resources Conservation Council. Do we still have half an hour? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if you can, yes. Okay. If you can go a little shorter, <laughs> that'll be good. And we could come back. We can cover a little time. But the, there's a little window in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I think I'd like to give you five minutes history for those of you who are new to conservation districts. We're going to focus primarily on the, the, our block grant experience and our thoughts about um, this whole proposed reorganization. We could do a whole morning on agriculture. It would be fabulous to have actually all the partners come in and share. It would be fabulous to have one of those Friday mornings of things where all the Yag yeah, Water Partnership comes in and shares the work that we do collectively because there's other people of organizations that work together um, for many years. So I'm going to, to some degree, go through this memo and highlight, um, there's a one-pager that are some reflections on the past year, some of our needs. Uh, another page that highlights the block grants where we're get, giving sub-awards to conservation districts that are managed either by NRCC or VACD. And the last page is comments, uh, mostly questions, actually, on the reorganization proposed by ANR, and then this is our um, annual report which highlights some of our accomplishments in 2018. It has a really lovely pie chart that I'd like to kind of look come back. So a uh, quick history. Uh, conservation districts were created in the 1930s and 40s after the Dust Bowl to be the link between private landowners and the federal government in addressing soil quality issues. So we've been around a long time. Conservation districts are a um, subdivisions of state government, there's over 3,000 of them in the United States. And there's a framework um, that's modeled also in Vermont, where there's a state council, the State Natural Resources Conservation Council in Vermont, which Carrie is um, the contracting administrator of. And that council is actually the mechanism through which conservation districts came into existence. And on that council, there are representatives of the Agency of Agriculture, Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, UVM Extension, representatives of the conservation districts, and then the feds and the ACD as, as non-voting members on the council. So that's basically the governance structure of conservation districts. Conservation districts in Vermont, there's a map in here, were organized based on either watershed or county boundaries or a combination of the two. The boards of districts are elected by landowners. Um, originally, um, it, it was a very formal election process. Often it ends up being appointments as um, their retirements, selecting uh, people with the appropriate skills that the district needs. Every district has a district manager. Some of them are still not yet full-time positions, um, and some districts have several um, district staff. VACD also has a technical staff primarily uh, working um, 
with funding from both the feds and the state agencies to enable farmers to participate in federal farm bill programs. So our staff do land treatment planning, conservation planning, nutrient management planning. So that's a broad sweep. Conservation districts now, so as a result of Yeah, sure. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chair, there's some talk about the conservation districts maybe overseeing water quality programs, or there's a possibility of that. You know, for you know, sort of you know, as we move forward with water right. quality and and how you know managing grants and all those kinds. So we'll, we will speak to that. You will. So you'll yes. let us know if you think that's a good idea, yes. something We're you're gonna, comfortable with, we or have something lots of questions you're not. at this point. Oh, yes, we will okay. speak to that. Right. Um, generally, we work in the programmatic areas of agricultural, natural resources, restoration, right. and stormwater mitigation. We have grants. Um, um, speaking, we now have. Um, an umbrella grant from the Agency of Agriculture through council that supports districts to do education and outreach, nutrient management planning, preparation. And then VACD has a federal grant that pays farmers to get their nutrient management plans. Our focus has been primarily on small farms throughout the state of Vermont. And we could go on about the ag programs, but I don't want to get well there too much. Generally, the Clean Water Fund has been great for us. Um, there's a, a regulatory framework that supports sort of driving people to implementation. We're there as the, the, as the, the soft hand that can provide the technical support and assistance, both knowledge exchange and assisting farmers and towns to access a wide range of programs um, that are available through state and federal partners. So we played this sort of a technical advisor, case manager um, role. What is, um, is, would you? Uh, Senator Parent was asking about the sort of the regulator and or police sort of policing kind of a role, um, but you don't ever have that kind of. Role. That's right. That's we right. were founded, and so was NRCS, on the principle for the agricultural sector, voluntary landowner implementation of conservation practices, on the assumption, and on the understanding that it's in farmers' interest to, to protect their land, and it um, you know improves their bottom line. Um, so. We may be asked to go speak to a farmer who's received a letter from the agency of ag and offer assistance. So we definitely do do that. But we may say, you're, um, you're, when you get a visit, you're going to be in trouble. So you better might as well start working on this now. <laughs> you know, we definitely do that. But we don't do inspections. We don't formally report violations um, to the agency. So, but we definitely do pre-assessments uh, on the farm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Really, I think I'm going to focus primarily the rest of my five minutes on um, block grants. So we've, we've really appreciated the block grant that's come through the Agency of Agriculture, which is a four-year grant, as Laura explained, has some flexibility. We've established a wide set of deliverables and goals. What it's enabled districts to do is to staff up. You know, we, we've had mostly one- or two-year grants, and it's not great for staff retention and training. And it's really, the feds give us five-year grants, but it's really fabulous to get a four-year grant from the Agency of Agriculture, where districts can um, develop you know, a longer-term vision. And it was, we had a significant period of time to think about that and try to develop a program that's really based on following up on nutrient management plan implementation and doing education and outreach to get farmers into the, excuse me, to have brought more water, the nutrient management planning system. So that's one. Um, no water. There's no water here. Block grant. Oh, yeah, no water. I thought I brought some. Yeah, no, it's, for it. it's probably on my kitchen counter. Um, so we have been, conservation districts have been working in basin planning mm -hmm. um, forever, really on a voluntary basis. And um, through the Clean Water Act, we now receive a small amount of funding for basin planning. We think of basin planning as the, as the foundation from which program implementation arises. Our role is to really engage local citizens in the basin planning process and to bring technical expertise and natural resources to the basin planning process. We received a small um, grant again through council of eighty thousand dollars to pay staff to do assist the DDC with basin planning. It's not enough. You know, it's about five thousand dollars a district. Um, so it involves organizing public meetings attending technical sessions, doing education and outreach, doing monitoring, and those kinds of things. But it's just a good thing, it came from the Clean Water Act. Um, we manage a block grant for Street, so that's for um, 
Natural Resource Project and Stormwater Mitigation Projects. What we like about that model is that conservation districts basically can apply to council. They submit a project concept. They um, do a approval of subcontract form, DC, and when that's approved, we can get a grant agreement out in a week. It really enhances the efficiency, um, both for districts in terms of implementing projects and for the person on the ground who's trying to get the um, project implemented. Uh, so right now, uh, what DEC has done a number of block grants that um, fund the different segments of the project development implementation process, right? We have basin planning. This year we have a pro new project development grant. It's actually not on our list yet. We have a block grant for implementation. It'd be nice to have a little more, you know, fluidity between those, but it's great that we have all of them because it enables us to do the whole process rather than districts having to write a grant for the study, then write another grant for you know, the public process, and then write another grant for the 30% design and write another. So there's quite a bit of improvement in the system. We think it could be um, expanded and built upon. I can't remember the, uh, it was not quite a horror story, but I think last year you were talking about. 124 grants. 124 grants. grants, and it was like 800,000. It was very small money, right? So it was a it lot of grant writing and management overhead for a relatively small dollar. That's right. So the, the role that council's playing is the sort of central contract is really helping districts in that regard. We do a lot of um, collaboration with the districts to determine what is feasible for you to do, how much can you do, that goes into our proposals, but then we establish a structure and we really value that um, structure that supports really quality control, training, consistency of programming. Um, consistency of reporting. It gives the funder some one, a body to talk to rather than 14 bodies. I think our funders have very much appreciated that. Um, we have wanted to note the issue around staffing. So the Agency of Agriculture has been able to staff up. Department of Environmental Conservation hasn't. And I think part of their proposal is an attempt to address that. We would favor staffing up with DDC further rather than creating a different structure that basically is shifting that staffing to a different level. Because for us, the basin planning process is a foundation, and those staff are the technical experts that help hold the big picture locally. Um, so we would support additional, we'd love to have the basin plan in every basin, you know, we could afford it, of course, you know the state budget is limited. How many um, basin plans don't have a full-time basin cleaner? There's full-time basin planners, but they cover multiple basins. So there's five basin planners right now. And, and just like two or three folks managing the millions of dollars that DEC is trying to pass down. So we support the strengthening of your DEC staffing. As the agency of Ag has done, it's worked really well. It's very smooth, as Laura has noted. Um, and we also support the, the empowerment of the basin planning process just to be the sort of foundation of this local initiative. And so when you say more DEC staff, you're talking very specifically about support for basic plan. Yes, and for grant programs. And grant okay. Right. You've heard it from all of us. We need longer term funding. We appreciate the initiatives that are happening to try to find a stable source of funding for the Clean Water Act. We appreciate longer term um, grant agreements. And we also need a balance of capital and non-capital funds. Um, we need the non-capital funds for the education outreach, the assessment, the capacity building within the organization, the infrastructure that ensures quality and consistency, the reporting, you know, the state is moving towards a standardized um, reporting framework so that they can plug it into T the TMDL, basically. We need, um, we need time for that. You know, there's a lot of time involved, and uh, still, our district staff and, and our council staff have to glue together their jobs by like a little 10% of this agreement, 15% of that agreement, can we hire a whole person? And we don't actually have whole people right now, we have shared people um, with technical expertise because that, that challenge, we'd like to see some more whole people that are fully funded to support the management of all these programs. Um, so that are you comes. bringing forward anywhere a budget proposal that, that reflects your assessment that you could use higher level of staffing? We asked um, through the Agency of Agriculture, and that's actually my last bullet, thank you, on this one, um, for uh, $68,700 as an increase for the infrastructure of council. 
And then for every project, you know, we have to debate with our funder of how much it can we put into project development and administration versus uh, implementation. And, and it's grant by grant. Um, it would be fabulous to have a staff, conservation district staff, who weren't worried about, like, can I afford to go to this meeting who's going to pay me? Uh, we still have that in some districts. You know? It's really unfortunate because they have a lot of local knowledge and expertise. So we would love to beef up um, council. So right now, council and BACD have a partnership where we have um, jointly funded staff, basically. Council is a state agency, but they have no state positions. So we see BACD is the, um, the employer contracted through council, and we also have some staff who work directly on contract, and council has a, a contract with the um, Caledonian district for um, Karen's position. So again, it's not ideal. We're putting it together. We've got some fabulous people, as Laura mentioned, and um, we'd, like to, we'd really like to beef up that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So in general, I'm going to sort of hand off to Carrie here. Uh, so Carrie will answer there. my question. And Carrie's okay. going to discuss Great. this question. I mean, generally, we're liking the block grant concept. And we're liking this centralized concept. We've tended towards centralization for a reason, basically, which is that we're a small state. There's limited resources. There's limited expertise. We feel that with a block grant model, there can be consistency of, of service delivery and the product that we're delivering um, through that, if it's a well-managed block grant structure. Well, and that circle up on the whiteboard there is uh, you know, a table of sorts. And those are all the partners that we you know, identify as part of that whole system of doing water quality work throughout the state. And one of our questions is, how do we try and make sure that table is you know, run fairly? So that uh, you know, it would seem natural that it, depending on where you are in the state, to be somewhat direct about it, an RPC might be better positioned in one part of the state or a council in another part of the state. And um, so it'd be interesting for us, I think we're, we're trying to explore how to do more of that empowerment and block granting, but make sure that the pathway we move down is helpful and supportive to everyone out there so, so that in the end we get the best results for the money and the best that's entertaining. So, and I guess this is for you and for the committee just to make sure I'm on the same page. So we're looking really at two things. We're looking, trying to find a funding source, and we're also looking at a governance structure, right? Exactly. And so right now we're talking about is there a way to rework the governance structure so that there's more closer proximity to projects, project management, all those kinds of things. Because one of the things that sounds like is on the table as a possibility is making one of these, each of these conservation districts responsible for clean water funding, for, for implementing clean water funding locally, which would also mean Correct me if I'm wrong, giving them greater authority for whoever gets this. Right. That so is, that's actual, right. you know, you being able to say you're you know, not getting the job done and they're, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, I just wanted to kind so, of tee it up in my own mind just so I'm understanding yeah. a little bit about. Well, and I'm the, still the, exploring this uh, with you guys. Yeah, no. I'm right, just seeing right. that uh, the new legislation, and so we're, we're still asking a lot of questions and yeah. trying to get our heads around it. Um, but I just want to say, because I serve two roles, um, I have a perspective of, of being the administrator for our state council, so I, I'm at the a policy level. I'm managing the statewide programs that we have in the block grants. Um, but I'm, I'm also a district manager, and so I'm actually doing the work on the ground. I'm implementing the water quality projects. I work in all sectors. I work with small farms on nutrient management. I work with towns on stormwater uh, master planning. I work with uh, road crews on a road erosion inventory. So I've got a perspective from you know, being the boots on the ground, but then also at a policy level. And I, I think what's really important to me is that um, that we're, we're supporting the people who are doing the work on the ground. And I, I can say from my own experience that when there is a funding policy or an RFP that comes out that's out of step with how things are done or how they work, or um, it doesn't make 
my job smoother or it doesn't help me accelerate water quality implementation, it kind of feels like a knife in the side sometimes because I, I feel like we need to be listening to the people that do the work on the ground. And I kind of want to remind everybody that we're probably not going to hear from them very much because they really don't have the resources to be in here. I'm sorry, will you back up and tell me? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What makes you feel like you have a knife in your side when what happens? When, so, you know, when an RFP comes out yeah. of funding policy or legislation, that makes yeah. my job on the ground, I'm talking about the Caledonia County part, right. yes. um, when it makes it tougher, when, right. it, when it slows it down, yeah. when it doesn't accelerate it, when it doesn't smooth Absolutely. the gears. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. I, and I feel like that's really what we should be trying to do. Sure. And so we need to be listening, Absolutely. I think, to the people on the ground doing this work. And so when policy is developed behind closed doors without, you know, Consulting. Kind of consulting, it, yeah. it's a no, little odd for me. Right. And so that's sort of why I'm trying to absorb this. Yeah. Um, I well, do. And sorry. sorry. Well, just, and that's exactly why we're happy you're, you're here. Yeah. I think what, as we look at that table up there, whoever all those partners are, mm -hmm. we're really looking for the most productive, uh, cost effective way of doing the work. And I would also add on top, you know, a respectful relationship between all the partners so that people feel valued and get to do their best work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but can you say a little more about the, sorry, the, the knife and the side thing? Well, well that maybe was a little dramatic. No, but it's ah. our attention is good. No, legislators often think they're really? doing right and put, put cogs in the wheels yeah. of progress yeah. on so people I really implementing on the yeah, ground. On a concrete level, so what, yes. what, what's an example of someone, as Senator Rogers was saying, thinking we're doing the right thing, but it actually turned out to be a hassle for you and slow you down or make your job harder? Well, um, I mean, I'll probably try to take, take a bit more of a positive spin on this and this, to say that, um, you know, when, when we, um, our, our agreement with the Agency of Agriculture, it's a four-year agreement, four-year block grant, statewide, single agreement, we get it out, the work out to 14 districts. Um, it's a performance-based agreement. We're working very closely with the Agency of Act to set up a tracking structure. That works really well. Okay. So with DEC, we're getting there. It's a little bit more piecemeal. Like, so we've got, we still have, some, council still has small agreements yeah. for work that takes us through the beginning to the end. So it kind of starts with basin planning. Yeah. Um, that's a, a, a very, in my opinion, you know, pretty robust regional structure that we already have is the basin planning, but in my opinion, it's under-resourced and under-supported. Watershed groups um, don't have the funding. What's the implication of under-resourced, under-supported, that the plan is not updated enough, or? Get the work done. It's slow. It's slow. Slow, yeah. I mean, and that's the foundation of it. Okay. But then we have project development, and then we have project implementation. Um, and we have programs along the way, like buffers and things that we try to fund along the way. So you know, I see this as a, as a you know a pipe you know as we call it a pipeline before, um, and it's it's an under resourced pipe pipeline. The the pieces aren't always fitting together, mm -hmm. um, but we just restructured and retooled, and we do have these block grants now from DEC. So this is why I'm not trying to say that it's you know it's not working. I think we're just getting there. We've had one season, one field season with our implementation block grant. So it, it hasn't had time, in my opinion, to work. And so when I see legislation that talks about restructuring, mm -hmm. I, I'm hearing the phrase, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. I haven't used that expression a lot, but I, w I would really be supportive of, of, of collaboratively trying to you know, really give the resources that the existing structure needs to mm -hmm. work better look at basin planning as our existing regional model and kind of go from, from there. So, so are you responding, yeah. just I'm not, so this is responding to your bill? Right. Or so part, I just want to get a sense of which specific. And it's premature, I'm right. this there's preliminary thoughts. There. So there's yeah. a proposal, Yeah. Uh, the, the lead developers of it have been agency uh, natural resources. That is not the bill we have in this committee. The okay. bill of the committee is basically status quo with, and we're thinking about, and you know, we've talked some about could, block granting is working well. Could we do more of it? Yes. And then the question is, well, how do you do that well? Mm -hmm. The, uh, I'd say, more uh, ra radical reorganization, creating 
uh, stormwater utility districts around the state, whatever they would be called. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, a, another whole conversation yeah, that's outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get to it, but mm -hmm. that's not front and center for what we're doing at the moment. Okay. Well, then what are we doing at the moment? Yeah, so I'm, I'm my, really, this is, my sense ahead. is that we're taking <clears throat> maybe a more conservative approach as in building on, we hoped that the movement to block ranking was going to be helpful to all the partners last year. So you're not doing 24 grants for $800,000, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my sense is there's maybe an opportunity to build on what we started last year, do uh, fund more block grants, and it empowers more partners outside of mainland government to take on more work. Which yes. is great, but yes. I, that's not really us, is it? Uh, I think it's appropriations. I'm just trying to get a sense of what we're so going to be deciding. So uh, <clears throat> my shorthand for talking finance is going to raise money. Yeah. Most is going to send the money out. Mm -hmm. But those committees are looking for this committee, I think, to say, what's the most robust, well-structured program that we can put together? So because they're not going to have the time to uh, dig into all of the uh, things that we're going to look at here. So we're really recommending a program. The, the funding decisions, for sure, are made in finance. The appropriations decisions, for sure, are made in institutions and in appropriations. So we know that, but they're looking to, to us to vet a program. And I'm hoping that what we're going to, that what we've been learning yesterday and today will let us say, are we on the right path? Can we do more of it? And where where are weak links in what we have now, and how could we strengthen them? Yeah. So thanks for that question. I don't. You know. No, it's just helpful. And I, again, I'm just raising these questions because they're just questions in my mind in terms of what some of the decisions we're going to have to make are. Right. Well, and we have we right. don't we suggest strategies. Right. In the corner, they fund programs. If they fund something different than we right. in our strategy, then. The funding's running the show. Right, that's what, right. yeah. So that's yeah. the, so that's, that's yeah. the, right. I'm right. not going to use the word, that's the coordination that we need to have mm -hmm. with that, absolutely. in order to yeah. get a result yeah. that works. Yeah, and I think for, for me, what I thought we were having a little bit of a conversation about is whether or not we're going to, and again, I could be ahead of myself, you know, are, are we taking your structure, are we considering your structure and expanding it in a way, are we going to be giving you more to, to actually do all sorts of things that you haven't done in the past around, you know, clean water, so. Yeah, and I. I Which could be exciting and yes, great. Yes. Yeah. It could be also, you could come back and say that. Knife is just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I think you know this is again. It's very preliminary. Yeah. I'm trying to keep an open mind, but I really sure. am open no. to the collaboration. Um, I, I, I'd like to dialogue. Um, I think what I what I saw initially felt to me like it was kind of creating something new okay. when we hadn't. Um, mm -hmm. And but I realize we're not there yet. Right. Um, so just right. we should sure we're all yeah. knowing what we're talking about. Yeah. This. Yeah. When you say what I saw initially, yes. you were referring to what document? Uh, what I saw from A&R, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's not a bill of this committee. Okay. Yeah. And that's, but that is why we need folks like you to come in, in here as it mm -hmm. goes through the pro right. process because we need, no matter what program it is, to yeah. hear from the people that are on the ground yeah. implementing yeah. it and make sure we're not putting those cogs in the wheel right. of progress. Yeah. And right. if we are going to expand, can we do it in a way that's right. going to work for all right. of you so yes. that you know you can get things done? Because as I looked at this map, I mean, it really is exciting to think about you know having somebody closer to projects in each of these districts running and managing these kinds of things. But it, without, you know, certainly you're going to have to play a big role in that if we can do that. So our third page is really reflections on that proposal from A&R. So it, we, it's a lot of it is questions. <laughs> and I don't know if so you I want to go into that. Right. I'm sensing that we probably oh, we're probably right. have time. Well, well, if you want to, where's the, what's, that's the, we have a big glowing through yeah. those. 
proposals. Yes. Right. And so I, I think we. So this is responding to the proposal, but we the one that we don't have yet in committee. The yes. one that we saw. Okay, okay. But that's good to have. Clarity, oh, yeah. you know, asking for there, there right. you know, questions, okay. clarity, preliminary thoughts about right. you know, what are shared about existing structures, um, supporting basin planning. You no, know, these are just some very kind of broad sweep. There's a couple specifics in there, but they may be moot if sure. they don't come to fruition. But um, these were just some of the th initial thoughts that we have had. So we just thought we'd share. Again, it's very preliminary. And what could you, I mean, could you also give some thought to um, what structure, you know, again, if we're going to be putting out all these projects throughout the state and, you know, the EPA is watching us, you know, we, we want to make put our best foot forward, you know, this is really important to all of us, what kind of structure would work uh, would be another way to, to also think about this from your end. Does sure. your structure, does, you know, the system that we have now, and what would the expansion look like? Mm -hmm. um, and that's another conversation. Sure. Yeah, and we could say broad sweep, strengthen basin planning. Yeah. And that, sure, we can absorb this, uh, council and districts can absorb a lot more. More. We're not saying we're the only players in the state. We do want right. to acknowledge the role of the other players. We're not saying, give it all to us and we'll manage it for you. <laughs> you <know>? Okay. <laughs> we're saying one of, we're one of the players that could do a lot more. Mm -hmm. And it's in our mandate. It's already written in law um, that this is our role. Well, and I think, you know, that, that as you say, we're trying to find the right framework so that the strongest partners, uh, my sense is that the strongest partners will vary by where we're talking about in the state. Where it would be a conservation district somewhere, it might be an RCC someplace else. I don't know who the third yeah, partners are. No, I mean, I don't know how we start mixing it. But I'm just wondering, Carrie, are you full time? Yes. As for Caledonia? Uh, yes. You are, but I, okay. I, he doesn't really. I have to share. I, I, they, I have. I have wear two hats, you, okay, so I'm that's, basically so, doing two jobs. But are most of these folks full time? Um, In other words, could they really, you know, again, are, are we talking about people who are full time employees that working nine to five, or would we be expanding people's jobs if we were to to give them? Uh, there's a there's a lot of opportunity for expansion. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. So thank you very thank much you. for coming in. It was really helpful. And, uh, and we're happy to come in. Any time you see a knife coming in. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you for waiting until post break. You'll I think you'll have everyone's better attention from everyone. On the other side of the break. Well, lots of coffee this yeah. morning. Um, so you've heard the conversation this morning. You know, we're uh, sorting our way through how to continue with this complicated set of state and non-state partners yep. to do water quality work. And I think, you know, we're looking for opportunities to do uh, more work better in the most cost-effective ways. And so I think part of why we're hearing from so many people in the last uh, two days is to have a better sense of what each partner is contributing. So there is not, just to reiterate, a formal governance reorg bill in this committee. And, um, we'll, we'll take it from there. Very good. Uh, yeah, so for the record, I'm uh, Charlie Baker. Um, I'm the executive director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, uh, but I'm here speaking to you today as the chair of the Natural Resources Committee chair for our state association of RPCs, which is BAFTA, the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies. Um, so if you're a little bit familiar with the regional planning commissions, um, and our boards are made up of the municipalities. Um, um, and so I was going to kind of tell you a little bit about what we did in FY18. Uh, so this page kind of tells you the money that uh, you flowed through or that we, you know, helped manage um, in the different grant programs that are currently set up, um, and then uh, and then get to how to improve the system because uh, uh, we very much share your interest in making a more effective, efficient system. Uh, for delivering clean water. Um, Can I have one extra thing to yeah. on that lift? The other thing is, I think we're all aware that what's, 
how we do clean water has changed a lot in the last three years, and it's going to change a lot more in the next three years. So yeah. I think part of what we want to do is try to anticipate that change. So whatever st structures we're settling on, they're also adapting. Yeah. Yeah, and it is evolving, and you know we're all learning more as we get into it. And I think we're still in the, the forming stages. Um, I, we have uh, some pretty good sense of the challenges, uh, trying to figure out the best way to tackle it. Um, and um, a lot of our role in water quality really stemmed from the initial Clean Water Act, you know, three years ago, that uh, kind of uh, made sure that municipalities and regional planning commissions had a role in the basin planning program. Um, so I'll get into that, uh, but thank you for your, kind of your work on supporting an effective system to date. Um, so uh, the punchline at the top of about $9 million in FY18 flowed uh, through RPCs in some way. Um, probably the biggest chunk was the grants and aid program, which was a program that uh, we really uh, developed cooperatively with DEC to get funding really pretty quickly through the RPCs, but um, and we really were just kind of facilitators and uh, monitors, kind of what does it look like before, what does it look like after. Um, DEC came, came up with a formula to allocate funding to municipalities that wanted to do you know, ditch projects or, or road erosion projects. Um, we had 173 municipalities participate last fiscal year. Over 44 miles of roadway were improved. Um, that is probably, if you want to talk about a grant block grant program or a grant program where it was really efficient with overhead was kept as low as it, the process was uh, efficient, it was just about accountability and getting money out in the, into the ground. That's probably, of all these examples, that's the best one. <laughs> so, um, and how that's run is uh, there's a contract between DEC and Northwest Regional Planning Commission on behalf of VACTA, so they're, and then they farm it out to the other 10 of us, there's 11 RPCs, and then we, um, and then they pay the towns too after we document that the work was completed. So it's just kind of, as long as the town documents or, we, or does the work, we document it, Northwest RPC pays the town, whatever, you know. And it wasn't big amounts per town, but it adds up. Sure. And how is it that the town knows what kind of projects to bring forward? Yeah, so, um, and further down, I talk about the road erosion inventories, but the RPCs and, and conservation districts, um, some towns themselves are doing the road erosion inventories. Uh, in my region, we happen to we happen to do that for all every one of our towns, um, and so out of that comes and working with DEC and uh, Jim Ryan, there's some prioritization of which segments are the worst. Uh, and then the negotiation really with the highway for which project do they want to do first um, and what, what do they want to use that money for. So it was really you know, negotiated with the town, but it was also one of their priority projects. Can you ballpark the, you know, so uh, roughly 45 miles, yep. but how many miles are out there to do? You know, like where are we on some sort of progress? Well, um, I'm gonna guess that, you know, that isn't even 1%. Uh -huh. of what needs to get done, but that's that's only judging from my region, yeah. seeing what was done, so I'm not sure exactly of that. I haven't seen that the state has gotten all of the road erosion inventories aggregated to know what the need is yet. Senator Ryan? Well, and I would just like to say from a uh, perspective from my town, they've already, on some of the steep hills, had to start redoing some of the ditches they've already rip grabbed which is a huge expense because there's no good way to reprocess the riprap. So they're like hauling it out and bringing in new stuff. It's extremely expensive. So they haven't even got around the town once and they're redoing some of the bad sections of road. So it's a huge issue. Hallelujah. Getting off to a good start. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of road work to be done. Mm. Um, the second program, uh, the Ecosystem Restoration Program, that's really the uh, we'll call it the kind of generic program that DEC runs. Um, it's got large and small projects, um, and that's kind of the dollar amount that we work with towns. Most, almost all of these were town projects. Um, you know, the RPC is really a facilitator. We're not the implementer or the owner. Uh, we're trying to help those projects get done. 
Um, the basin planning, um, I think uh, Jill did a good job talking about the basin planning. Um, last year we had 313,000 for that statewide. Uh, this year is 250,000, so we got a 20% you know, cut or something in that, as did the conservation districts. Um, this is a big challenge. Um, the, the the basin plans have gotten a ton better than they were five years ago. Lots of progress has been made. They're doing a good job now of uh, kind of identifying where there are needs. Um, but the basin planning, I'll come back to this, the basin planning process does need to be expanded and improved to be able to take, hey, there's a problem over there somewhere. We need to have some resources to go figure out what exactly should get done there. Um, that, that part of it, you know, whether it's called assessment or project identification, but that really identifying what should be done uh, work, there isn't enough funding going in there. Um, the second piece of the basin planning that needs to be improved is really allowing everybody at the table in that basin to look at the needs and prioritize what should be done more together. Right now it's a little ad hoc, what's ready, what's ready for that different grant program. Um, that could be brought together a little better. And the, the lack of it being brought together so far is based on what, you know, necessarily have literally everyone in the same room at the same time to look at a common list? Or? Um, in, that is partly happening. We, each of the RPCs are, have some sort of uh, whether it's a clean water advisory committee or I think in Northeast Kingdom, I think they call the River and Roads Committee. Um, we, we each have committees now where we have all the municipalities and the conservation districts and, and watershed associations and we're inviting people to the table. Um, I would say we don't have enough data coming out of the basin planning process to really identify what projects to do. So we're identifying high priority strategies, but not the individual projects. So I've read basin plans, but I don't really have a sense of what makes one helpful and you know actionable from your point of view. Can you say something about what additional basin planning work looks like to help you and your colleagues get more projects? Yeah, and I, I, and I would broaden that out. I mean, to help everybody. I think it's it's more um, when we identify or the basin plan identifies a problem area. It says it looks like there's. You know, some high pollution loads coming off of this part of the basin. Um, with being able to go in there and spend some time uh, analyzing what should get done, um, and then and then that would give us doing enough of that work would give us a good set of projects that should or could be done. Um, so it's it's really the more analytic following up to find out the pri high priority projects. I know that last year we looked at a database and I think it had something like 4,600 projects in it. Is this, is this a, I don't, I don't actually remember, maybe Mr. Chapman knows this. There's a database, I think it was a BC. Emily Bird, yeah. Yep. And um, it's all the projects. And are those, is that basically an aggregate of all the projects in all the basin plans? Um, there is not, part of the point I think I'm trying to make is not all the projects that need to be done have been identified yet. Okay. So that's the database of projects that have been identified by one party or another. So that they aggregate stuff from the districts, from the RPCs, from the towns, um, and I don't know to what extent they have ag projects, I don't know, probably not. Yeah, maybe after they're completed. But, um, so that's what's been identified so far. Um, and I think one of the challenges with what's happening right now is it's more about who has a project ready as opposed to is it the best project. Um, and that was, you know, there was kind of a backlog of demand to do clean water projects that has been getting met the last few years. Um, we're now, I think, starting to get into a phase of, okay, we address kind of the backlog, now what? And how do we make sure it's effective and efficient? Okay. Well, and that's Great, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, one of the concerns we John, had from the beginning was, um, did we, as we talked about really stepping up and in the last couple of years, did we have an adequate pipeline of projects? And could we refill it at the rate that we were going to complete stuff so that we don't have <coughs> boom and bust 
which is disruptive to everybody. I think that is, that's a challenge in front of us. Okay, yeah. So refilling the pipeline at an adequate rate is part of what stepping up our basin planning work is about for me. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, the, the next few, um, like the conservation districts, uh, DEC also contracted with the RPCs with a, a block grant, more focus on implementation. Uh, we have 11 projects uh, committed right now for implementation. Um, a good chunk of that money got spent in FY18. They will be finishing up in this fiscal year. Um, then uh, municipal highway storm mitigation, that's a program run through VTRANS, uh, about $2 million Sorry, there. Can yeah. you say a little something, who are block grants? So yeah. what kind of projects are those compared to other projects? Um, I think uh, they tend, from the projects that we got, they tend to be larger stormwater projects okay. that municipalities uh, wanted to work on. Yep. Um, the municipal highway storm or mitigation that was run through VTRANS also tended to be you know, m larger projects that had uh, transportation nexus, so they would run off from a bunch of streets. Um, that also you know, might have been uh, stormwater pond retrofits. So that last year we were talking about, uh, you know, if we're carrying up a road to do some transportation work, are we also looking at, while we're Mm -hmm. Tearing things apart, and we also do water quality growth at the same time. So that's the nexus you're talking about. Sure. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff, I think, is retrofit. You know, the roads are already there, yep. they have runoff, but is the runoff being managed <coughs> adequately? Um, the better roads and road erosion we've just already kind of talked about, um, but uh, we've been doing a lot of work with our municipalities on doing the inventories and prioritizing those. And then there is also supplemental funding that we seek out to other grant programs, uh, like Champlain Basin Program, High Meadow Fund. Um, my organization is able to do some of that as well. Um, and so those have helped with a range of different things, more on probably the education outreach uh, work than actual implementation. So maybe let's spend just a few more minutes on these uh, last bullets. Um, so one big change, I think the conservation district started uh, started this conversation um, and sorry I won't say like an aside but um, I think one of the challenges we've had with DEC I guess I said it <laughs> uh, um, but um, I think one of the challenges and I don't want Matt to take any offense but it would be great um, for the committee and the, the legislature to give more direction to a and r about their relationship with the partners because i think we have the, the if there was a knife in the side it would be there's a grant program that comes out that the partners weren't consulted about how it might work and so we're kind of like geez i'm not sure that is working best but and now we have to do a, re respond to a competitive rfp which takes a bunch of time and then we're negotiating the scope there's a lot of time lost because we don't have a cooperative relationship it'd be if i think we know who the players are it'd be good to just say and would you work with the partners to get money out for this purpose um and so it's more of a cooperative agreement and i think you know they're trying to be good and comply with procurement laws um but in this case it's kind of i'm not sure it's so how do you fix that? Um, by providing direction that they work with the partners in a cooperative agreement a cooperative, fashion. Okay. So we want to get to so cooperative agreements okay. rather than yeah. competitive agreements. Yeah. Um, so that seems like a okay. silly one, but no, it's, it actually has yeah. uh, been adding a lot of process, I think, unnecessary process and not making the process more efficient or more effective. Uh, the second bullet, I really am reinforcing the basin planning work on uh, Identifying projects, um, more investments needed there. Uh, I think it, I think the district brought up uh, the need to uh, have the watershed associations at the table as part of the basin planning. Uh, we made a request from the Clean Water Board for more funding for basin planning for that purpose. Um, so that, that it's important that all partners be at the table uh, for those conversations. Um, the third bullet, I think, maybe is a follow up to the basin planning question is there needs to be, and, and I think the agency is committed to developing a tool, a better estimating tool, so that we can say, oh, there's a, there's a problem out there, it's 
draining this X amount of square feet. Here's kind of what might get done there so we can get some estimate of, would that be a more cost-effective solution than some other project? Um, right now, that, you know, the estimating kind of happens at the back end. You know, when they're reporting to you how many pounds of pollution got redu reduced, it's because the project's done. We need some estimating tool at the beginning so we can say, what, what makes more sense to do? You know, should we re replace that riprap or is there something more cost effective to get the pollution reduction? So I think my sense is in the ag world, we have those tools, like people will look at there's things, not so much. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's a global need across sectors is to have better predictive models for the record match at the General Council Agency and Natural Resources. I think there's a lot of improvement. And that's not to say that we don't have some estimations and that we haven't modeled things in the context of the TMDL, but when you when you actually start getting down to individual product projects mm -hmm. and what type of reductions you see from them, mm -hmm. the, our precision sometimes is not as refined. And I know that there are actually projects going on, like as, as DePetra said, Nutrient is looking at, uh, the contractor with the agency of ag is looking at trying to come up with a tool focused on ag projects, and we're developing tools on the non-ag side of the equation. Yeah, uh, the next bullet, um, and this is more about uh, the, the clean water implementation report that I think you get from the agency that um, by, you asked them to report what state funding accomplished. Um, and so this is maybe more of a personal suggestion, but um, it would be, I think you get a better sense of what was happening if you asked them to report what was done with federal dollars, state dollars, municipal dollars, and even on private property. Uh, you're only seeing part of the picture when you see the state funding picture. Um, and there's obviously a lot more effort is going on across the state than I think what you're seeing in that report. Um, and then uh, in terms of project implementation, uh, natural resource projects, um, and and then just a point about uh, municipal project cost share. Obviously, what the state is unable to match, you know, turns into budgetary pressures on the municipality and potential property tax increases. So um, that's that's the way it is. So just uh, something to keep in mind as you think about this, because uh, and I know there's a lot of pressure on how to raise more money, and I, I should have said I didn't start off, but more money is needed to address the clean water needs across the board. So happy to answer more sure. questions. Or? Well, I think that the preliminary budget we got yesterday from uh, a &R shows a uh, step down of about $10 million from over last year's spending. And I'd you know, say to be direct about it, you know, all the conversations lead here to four have been about maintenance of effort. Maybe even actually last year in 260 was maintenance of effort plus adjustments for inflation, so we would slip backwards over 20 years. Yeah. So, um, but in terms of being able to hold to that, I think we one question that will come to us is okay, if we do see maintenance of effort, if we do find the full funding, can we spend those dollars well? So that gets back to a capacity and pipeline thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's a, a, a real question from me to you is like, we've picked up the pace. If we stuck to funding at the same level as last year, do you, is it your sense that we would still be spending those dollars well because we have enough capacity to spend that amount of money well? I think as, as well as we can right now, I think some of that money needs to go into the pipeline you know, identifying projects and doing those early assessments to get better projects, you know, in the second year or right. third year. Because we counted on the backlog to be able to launch. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we had an over-reliance on capital at the front end, you know, and, and now we need a little bit more non-capital money at the front end to feed the pipeline again. Uh, you know, I don't know what the proper mix is. I think you know, probably if you looked at VTrans budget or maybe even your own capital program, there's always like 20% of so of total funding that goes into, you know, identifying and assessing and planning good projects and then the conceptual design stage, uh, the, the non-capital part. Uh, and I, I don't know if I'm, that number is exactly right, but it might even be as high as 30%. So I've always had that number. You know, doing capital program work, there's always. I see, you know, it's a good chunk of money that needs to go in to figure out what to do. What, you want to do the right thing before you start spending capital. 
Um, the uh, other thing, some of the witnesses have talked about grant timelines, you know, so that uh, you have the block grant or whatever it comes to you and you have four years of support, not just one year. So are you seeing, are your grants covering longer periods of time yet? Like, no, I think we were on the one year cycle. I think, you know, that gets back to me into this cooperative agreement. I probably, it's a good point, I think, to add longer agreements because, yeah. you know, we're, right now we're spending a lot of time just in the responding to RFPs and negotiating and that we should just get into the negotiating up front and it'd be nice if it was a two or three year commitment or a four year, five year sounds great. Yeah, but I think if we know we're gonna have this work to do, let's do it and let's have you know annual check-ins to adjust the scope or something without having to reboot the whole procurement process again. So in terms of a, a longer, like a four year commitment, how does that work? You get four years worth of money in year one or you get a commitment that you're gonna receive 100,000 times four and it keeps coming out in chunks. Yes. Yeah. I, th I think more of the latter, you know, it's, we have a, a, a four year agreement so you're not negotiating the agreement every year, yeah. and the money is contingent like on the pledge. Le yeah, the, and the money is contingent on the legislature approving the money. Right. So you know there might be the tasks for the next year get adjusted somewhat. The money goes up or down. But uh, and we do this with our our own consultants. You know when we're uh, we have kind of a shell agreement we'll do for multi years, and we'll update it, or or as we have tasks that happen. Um, and I think something like that could definitely work. So I can imagine from a um, fiscal responsibility side, some people, all of us would say, well, when we hear about competitive bidding, then we figure out okay, probably you know, what's going to help us get the most project done for the dollar. And that should definitely happen at the, the, the construction stage and, and even if we're procuring like engineering services. Yeah. But in terms of the partners that are working on this with the districts or the RPCs and um, like we're going to be engaged in this no matter what, all the time, right. uh, and trying to facilitate whichever pieces. Right. So I think we could have a different cooperative relationship. Yeah. Water quality obligations, as far as the eye can see. <laughs> yeah, right. right. The work on in. I just made so why why are there so many of these? Just or why has it been up to this point just one year grants rather than multi year? Is there something that it's just the decision that's um, the legislative decision kind of thing? Why we okay? Yeah, I don't think okay. there's a direction to do anything yeah. else, and okay. right now it's all dependent on the annual budget cycles. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I think from the agency standpoint, they wouldn't have any there's security there. about yeah. doing any more. And the last thing I think I'll say is that the RPCs are you know very willing and you know interested in. Supporting if there is a more effective model to get money, you know, out like like that grants and aid where it gets yeah. money out quicker. Uh, very willing to have you know the supporting the idea of everybody at, in that basin sit around the table and decide you know who should facilitate and, and administer a piece, but you know for there's a more effective way to get money out. We're very willing to support that and also to flex how we support our. Our regions, you know, maybe that you know a few of my towns should be going to a meeting at a different region because they're part of that basin. Um, we don't, we're not stuck down our boundaries to facilitate this work, I guess. Sure. Um, okay. Um, just a quick question. You said 20 to 30 percent of money is roughly spent, you know, in the capital spending stage. But how much of resources are you guys spending procuring dollars from the state, like of time, commitment, anybody? Like how much of our spend is going you guys paying you back for trying to get grants from us or organizations like yours. I just it seems like we're that's, in a very inefficient process. That's typically not a reimbursable right. expense. So, but it's an expense somewhere. You got to pay some for the time. Yeah, I try not to look at that. <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't want to ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. Um, but I think you know I think all of us you know the districts and the RPCs are spending a lot of admin time. You know. We either responding to an RFP or negotiating with DEC before agreements get put in place, and, that, and that's part of what I think you hear is like that's a fiscal strain. Um, organizations that are, you know, we're, we're also governmental entities, so we're by definition nonprofit. We're not our government's not supposed to make money, um, and so we're you know, it's a strain. But do you have any idea? Just I I I don't. I really have not. Um, Somebody should have an idea. Do yeah, you, so you guys into have our indirect rate? Do you guys so, have lobbyists? In the building, do you guys actually contribute? The state association does. The association does. Yeah, that's what I thought they did. 
but yeah, no, I think that's I think it's a valid point, and I think that's a number that you should somebody in your organization should be able to put a finger on. Yeah, that's a, we'll come back with that next time. Yeah, the, this thing of uh, cooperative, uh, competitive, and I'm just trying to make sure I have sort of the right flavor of what that is in mind. So within uh, a state agency, if there's a water quality division, they would be bidding competitively to stay funded as a department or division. There would be an expectation that they would do that work. And then the money they received would be awarded through grants competitively, like you're saying, with the engineering or something like that. Yeah, and, and, and I'll speak to the RPC relationships with the other agencies. So for instance, for uh, VTrans, uh, we have a transportation planning initiative program with them. They know they're going to contract with the RPCs every year to assist them doing transportation planning. It's a cooperative agreement. We, they say, hey, let's adjust the scope of work next year with, you know, by doing X and Y. But the legislature and statute said, you're going to work, be trained, you're going to cooperatively work with, the, with all the RPCs on doing transportation planning every year. And so it's cooperatively developed the scope of work. We all agree to it. You know, it's, it's funded, obviously. Um, but it's, it's a different relationship than responding to an RFP and, and figure out who's responding and how, how to do it. Um, so I have a, um, it's like a chemistry class hangover question. That is, so when, uh -oh. uh, no chemistry is required. Um, when you have a, a whole chain reaction going on, there's always some uh, element in that chain of reactions that determines the rate for the overall reaction rate limiting reagent. So if we're looking at water quality work, from your point of view, where is that, what's the weight, the rate limiting? And what if all of a sudden seeing all this needs a, something unrelated to clean water? How do you protect that money that we're raising? Same way with transportation. Right, to, right. You don't separate those. I, it's just like the transportation fund and the stuff that's coming through institutions. We don't just go after money that's set aside for uh, municipal wastewater. We, it, it's that goes for municipal wastewater. We, yeah. and, and but the we, same we, with we, yeah. we yeah. do. Yeah. We have formulas for municipal wastewater, which are supported throughout the state as being necessary. And then we prioritize who gets municipal wastewater facilities. To a degree. And everybody supports that. And as each entity gets its municipal wastewater facility built, and there are others remaining on the list, the enthusiasm for supporting municipal wastewater statewide diminishes. And towns that were waiting their turn on the list of priorities to get things find that the, the critical mass of support for those things no longer exists. And the legislature and the state is off to different priorities. That's what happens. Yeah. And when small towns who wish to, to be supported in wastewater um, find out that the state's priorities have waned, they're told to do it on their own. And it is not, and this happens over and over again. Uh, uh, because there's not enough money to go around. No, there's enough, well, there was enough money to go around when the plan was made, but once people have gotten what, many people have gotten what they need, the notion, perhaps you're correct in the way you phrased that, or the, the, the notion that for the, 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 there's not enough money to do the rest of the things. Right. And then you get on to the next priority. For the most part, the, the lists that are brought into us in committee are funded. I'm not saying that people don't drop off that list from time to time. but. And I think the only thing I would want to build around, you know, the, the reason, you know, is, so what if, how do you, what if DEC were to come and say, okay, we want to have five projects this year? Like, I just want to make sure that 
you know, the work is actually getting done that needs so to get done. You don't trust Matt. <laughs> No, we don't trust the court, sir, if I may. I mean, you're no, you know, we, we trust us. All of a sudden, somebody goes yeah. in and says, you know, really, you know, there could be a We don't trust anybody around here. Right. We trust but ourselves. You not to trust John. You trust yourself. We I don't trust, trust you. ourselves. <laughs> So when, 50 uh, years from now, so, a different group of legislators going to be here, and they say, they're going to say, well, those were good fellows 15 years ago, but our priorities are. Okay. So, so three. Oh, years ago, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a really good, interesting <laughs> conversation, though. It no, really it's, is, it is interesting, but important, I think. The projects coming into institutions, the wastewater projects, are usually a dozen, 15, 20 year choosing. You're, you're going through. You're not necessarily going through 4,600 projects that can be. There's a lot of them on their list. Transportation's going through probably more than 4,600. So 4,600, they're not. They're saying 4,600 wouldn't come in the first year anyhow. You know, I mean, it would be whatever the biggest priority is. Are. Saying all so they might have. This is going to be the real dirty ones go first. 350. Well, and if there are 4,600, right, then. Maybe we are able to fund the first 300, and then we know what's coming for next year, so maybe we need to raise more money next year. That's, that's my perspective, and I'm not saying no, that's it's the direction yeah. we're going to go. I'm just saying that right. it seems like a better way to plan to me. So I'm hearing amongst all the conversation that one of the projects, one we need to prioritize, better prioritization yeah, absolutely. to everybody, that we need maybe better data collection that goes along with projects because it'll provide feedback and people monitoring them. And it will also help with the models that are underneath prioritizing projects. Better data means you improve the model and then you'll, you'll have a more accurate predictive um, prioritization process. So I'm writing all those three down. Um, it's not a crazy idea. Ms. Arachi. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Up about thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. okay. I, I wanted to make a comment about um, what prioritization means. You know, it's easy to just like go identify a bunch of projects based on their potential phosphorus reduction. But whether you're actually going to be able to do that project, you know, it depends on soil conditions. It depends on the landowner. It depends on the community cost share. You know, there's a lot. So getting from priority to shovel ready is there's a gap there. That we found that there's generally inadequate funding for that phase, and that's part of the reason why we have 4,600 projects on the list, and we're not clear which one is really shovel ready. So there hasn't been enough money put into that pre-assessment scoping. We're calling it project development right now, right. whatever you want to call it. Right. There hasn't been adequate funding for that so that you you that it's re, you know that the shovel ready, that the town's already agreed to pay its part, the landowners already agreed to this project, there's been some kind of environmental impact assessment, we know what the soils are, things like that. Right. That would you, you know, because you could just say, yeah, this will be a big bang for your buck on phosphorus. And so not what, what's your bottom line in that as it relates to what uh, there needs to be more upfront funding. When you talk about prioritization, you need it to to get to its priority and its shovel ready. All the conditions are in place that when they sure. are, you know, to it actually be That's implemented. What, what those other committees, they are. That's what we're saying. Yeah. There are other processes in state government right. where that, that preliminary work has been done right. and it is moved up through the chain and it is shovel ready and it's ready for money. And I'm basically right. saying we need more funding to do that work. And, sure. it's and, us and, and, and I would agree with this. And you and the RPCs, you're the people on the ground that are, that, that, funnel, it, funnel. that would, right, that would right. funnel those projects up. Right. And I think that's fair for you, for the agencies even, to say, show me that this is ready. <laughs> May I just call a witness who is either Mr. Chapman to wait on this? Well, I mean, I think it's worth not forgetting, uh, I think two points. One is, is that the type of money that we're dealing with is incredibly important here because capital funding, for the most part, is not the type of funding you use for this pre-design conceptual planning phase work. So generally speaking, when we go to the institutions, they do not want us. If it's not related to a real brick and mortar project, they don't want us right. using bonded money for that that work. So yeah. right. the, the color right. of the money matters I think we agree with that. in this yeah. particular yeah. situation. And we have been primarily capital heavy for the past yeah. series of years. That is proposed to change. Right. Um, and I think the other thing, just to be clear about, unlike most 
capital or transportation projects. Municipalities and other institutional partners have a role and a desire to do this pre-planning work before it ever comes in for design and being shovel ready. That doesn't exist with this, this sort of set of projects. We're trying to drive um, interest amongst the world, both finding problems and solutions to those projects. So it's, it's, it's different than what we're used to in the traditional capital planning process, whether that's a, a building capital planning or a, a transportation capital planning process. Okay. So this has been a very, very challenging, challenging discussion. Interesting. Okay. And so we need to go on to our next witness. So I would just ask also, because to circle back around what we'd also talked about, which would be you know, the state playing a role. The state is ultimately accountable to the EPA, so the state playing a role in what the regional goals are of hitting those nutrient reduction levels and setting those goals for areas. And that's going to play into your project prioritization and development of, of bang for the buck. Is, you know, what are the goals of each region in, in nutrient reduction and how does that weigh into projects? So just sort of circling it back around to where, where we initially started half an hour or so ago. Mm -hmm. So, so well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Some of, it, some of the, from the discussion, we talk about partners here all day long and we never, we never talk about what happens when one partner wants to walk away from the, their previous partner or but the other partner wants to walk away. And we, we behave as if it's a partnership, and it's not. And unless there's a prenuptial agreement amongst these partners, it is a meaningless word. It is meaningless. I said the word shall in this. But, it, well, but any legislature in the future can change, can, uh, shall be can, un, can remove shall. And it's a bigger, and the Vermont Yankee thing, the one request that Vermont had was, if the money runs out, who's going to pay for the, what's left over? And the choices were all the ratepayers in New England that, that benefited from Vermont Yankee, or just the ratepayers in Vermont. And, the, and we would not get an answer from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who can preempt us. So we're going ahead down there. With all that talk our, about partnership and money being in the bank, with no, with no prenup on who's left holding the bag if Vernon and Brattleboro get all the money and it runs out. So that's the thing. It's a good well, you'll help us keep our eye on, make sure we don't lose <coughs> track of that challenge. So good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I think you've visited with us before. So this is my first time visiting with you guys. Welcome. So if you could yeah. introduce yourself for the record, that would be great. Absolutely. I'm Lynn Mano, and I'm the director of Watersheds United for Mom. Based where? Watersheds United. No, based where? Oh, based where? Yeah. I'm based in Montpelier. Montpelier. That's the right. Um, I just wanted to wait before I. Yeah. I've prepared some remarks to you based on what I thought you guys wanted to hear today, um, but I just wanted to weigh in with one thing just based on the conversation that we were just having. You psychologist um, by any chance? What was that? Psychologist? No. Okay. We need one in this room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about, you know, thinking about what you guys were saying in terms of those priority projects and can't we just have that list yeah, to be yeah. able to choose from? And the thing that I think is so challenging for all of us working in this field mm -hmm. is it's a juggling act to get to meet our goals. And there's that list of however many projects and to meet our goals in terms of watershed health and water quality, yeah. it's figuring out how we can choose those projects that will get us there. And it's not always going to be a, a, a certain prescribed project because often we're working with landowners. It's uncertain funding sources. Sure. There's so many pieces to put together that I think of it as like this big group of projects that then we need to choose from, and it might be this selection that ends up being feasible and a priority to get to. So we definitely need more assistance and guidance in terms of prioritization, but I feel like there's always that kind of built in with this type of work. It's a complicated juggling act. That's all I'm going to say on that. Um, but then I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Do you pass that out, or would you so rather? So here, I only brought one copy, but I'm happy to send this to all of oh, you guys. Right. Yeah. It's okay, okay, because if you hand it out, they then start looking at the pictures, <laughs> and they won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you, Senator Bray, and 
members of the Committee on Natural Resources and Energy for giving Watersheds United Vermont on behalf of watershed groups an opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Lynn Munnow, and I'm the director of Watersheds United Vermont, and we call ourselves WAV, so that's how we'll, I'll be referring to ourselves. Um, and I plan just, because I haven't been here today, I thought yeah. I'd give you a brief overview of yeah. WAV and of watershed groups' work. Um, and then I would think I was asked to talk about some um, successes and challenges with how the Clean Water in Initiative is working right now, and then maybe some thoughts on um, the proposed funding distribution model that I've heard about and some criteria that I feel like is important as we move forward. Um, but Watersheds United Vermont is an association of community-based watershed groups in Vermont, and we have a mission of empowering watershed groups to protect and restore Vermont's waters. And WAV supports groups in three different ways. We provide <coughs> information, resources, and training to watershed groups throughout the state. We provide opportunities for collaboration and partnership among watershed groups and also with partner organizations. And we also act as a representative um, and a voice at the statewide level. After, after Tropical Storm Irene, watershed groups that were working on really similar kinds of efforts and projects across the state began having conversations across watershed boundaries and realizing that they had a lot to learn from each other about best practices and how to solve common challenges. And so groups got together to form Watersheds United Vermont as a, as a statewide agency to help support that process. Who supports your work financially? Um, foundations. Foundations, so yeah. you're a nonprofit. I'm a, we're, yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and, and then we also received some funding um, recently through the, through DEC to provide, through the Clean Water Initiative, and I'll describe that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so we provide weekly information to groups on uh, funding opportunities, events, trainings, to keep everyone connected with what's happening at the state level. Um, and then we host uh, two conferences a year to provide um, uh, training on both technical topics and also on organizational topics, um, and then some standalone trainings uh, as needed throughout the year. So, who are these community based watershed groups and why are they so important to clean water? So, we have roughly 40 member organizations across the state, including some conservation districts. These groups vary in size and in focus. So, we work with some really small groups that are all volunteer organizations. <coughs> and they may focus on just a couple of key activities in their watershed um, for watershed protection and restoration. Maybe a group just focuses around water quality monitoring or on river cleanups or on a very specific area. But most of the groups we work with are small staffed nonprofit organizations and they're really working on a full suite of watershed protection activities and they're also key partners for the state and reaching our clean water goals. So just to give you a sense, so you, maybe you've heard of some of these groups before, I'll just list a few of the groups. Maybe there's one in your, one in your area, but um, so the Friends of the Winooski River, the White River Partnership, Connecticut River Conservancy, Franklin Watershed Committee, Friends of the Mad River, Friends of Lake Champlain, the Lewis Creek Association, the Memphis Magog Watershed Association, the Missisquoi Basin, River Basin Association and others across the state. Any in Bennington County? Uh, no. <laughs> there are some. There, I mean, we have some um, volunteer groups there, and we work closely with. Um, so there's. Uh, you're, you're reaching. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. So first of all, Connecticut River Conservancy That's works good. across okay, the so state, and then we have um, the uh, Southeast Vermont. Southwest. We're southwest, sorry. Well, we'll, no, we'll continue the conversation about Bennington at some point. <laughs> he only focuses on Bennington. He's <laughs> no, really not sorry. worried about the rest of the state. That's not true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, we do. Oh, so you're, are you thinking of like the, the Hudson? Yeah. The Hudson yeah. drainage. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess my county is in county assistance. It's okay. Because I'm thinking Windsor and you're talking about Bennington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, uh, um, so we have the Baton Kill um, Conservancy, right. which works right. across Vermont and right. New York. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we. Um, 
we also have the the Hoosick River Watershed Association Great. down in that area. Great. So yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, thanks. No, that's helpful. That's okay. Um, and then we also work, and then that's so that you got just actually to a really interesting question, which is like, oh wait, is there a watershed group here and here? Mm -hmm. And the answer is. There, is, there are not consistent watershed groups across the state. We have, a, as I said, we have some areas where we have more all volunteer groups uh -huh. and some really staff groups. And we rely really heavily on working with conservation districts. Right. And in many cases, the conservation districts are really acting as the watershed group in their area. Mm -hmm. So for Makes instance, sense. the Poultney Meadowy Conservation yeah. District, there isn't a watershed group partner in that area. I work really closely with Hillary Solomon in that area, mm -hmm. who's really working on that full suite of um, watershed protection and restoration activities. And um, in cases where we may have a conservation district and a watershed groups, then those groups end up really complementing each other by either focusing on different areas of the geography of the watershed or on um, working in, in certain sectors. So the conservation district may work more on agriculture in a given area where um, the, uh, water, the watershed group may work on stormwater management with, with, um, with the landowners. So, Right. There's, there's great partnerships and collaborations going across um, those two groups. Um, so just a quick question. So for yeah. member groups, do you have any guesstimate as to how many people that means out in the field, whether they're volunteer or actual full-time? I'm just trying to have a sense of scale. Um, oh, gosh. Um, well, I think it depends. So like our so I'll just give an example. So Friends of the Winooski River, based right here, right? They're, they have, um, you know, two part-time staff working, and then when they're doing projects, they'll bring in, um, you know, they'll engage other partners, they'll engage when they're doing um, riparian buffer plantings, they may have, you know, 100 to 200 volunteers in a season working to help them. So even for our staffed groups, the power of volunteer um, support. support is huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some rely more, it, you know, it varies a lot group to group, a lot of these groups. So many of these groups have started um, really organically with concerns in their, in their local watersheds for their, their rivers and streams and lakes and ponds. And so they've grown in different ways. So some end up relying more on, um, on staff and paid work crews, say, to do riparian buffer plantings. Other may do, others may um, use more volunteers. Um, and what, one of the things that we've seen, which is really important, is that those organizations with more capacity um, are able to be uh, project managers and um, project partners with the state in order to accomplish our, our clean water goal. Um, I just want to make sure that I kind of hit everything that I was going to here. Um, but I want to thank the, the legislature. I know you guys have been, I've been hearing some of the grappling today that you've been really working, I know, throughout the last couple of years to find appropriate levels for funding clean water. And um, I really appreciate also the significant efforts of Treasurer Beth Pierce in developing the Clean Water Report and agree that we need a substantial investment in clean water dollars. And we feel strongly that we need a dedicated long-term funding source providing su sufficient funding to meet all of our obligations under the Clean Water Act. I'll share just a few of my thoughts on how the Clean Water Initiative is working and areas that we feel there could be improvements to, in to increase our effectiveness in, in accomplishing clean water goals. So as we've all talked about, and I'm sure you've heard from, from, from Jill um, and Carrie, um, it takes time to develop and scope priority projects. It takes time to do education in communities and outreach to specific landowners, to design different stages of projects, to implement projects on the ground, and to monitor and maintain projects in the future. It can take several years, and these projects are not possible without a commitment of state funds and a consistency of state funding programs. Not only are state dollars through the Clean Water Initiative program critical to groups to conduct on the ground projects, but watershed groups also utilize these funds to leverage significant private dollars from businesses, foundations, and individuals, as well as federal dollars to accomplish this work. I was talking to um, one of the watershed groups yesterday, and she was saying she, that um, they are able to leverage usually 100% on the, on the state dollars. And so the, the state dollars are critical for them to be able to not only do the work, but for to be able to, 
to raise those private and federal federal dollars as well. And it's always a you know a, um, a Herculean task to piece together those different funding sources in order to to do those projects. And another reason that I think that it's really important that groups know ahead of time that they have a commitment of these clean water dollars to be able to then leverage those funds to do these projects. DEC staff are key partners to support the development and implementation of clean water projects. And watershed groups work closely with watershed planners and river scientists, and of course, other staff permitting partners, et cetera, as needed. Um, and working and communicating with, these, with DEC technical staff makes these projects smoother and more efficient. There are areas of the state where watershed planners have more time to engage at the community and watershed level. And this level of engagement would be beneficial in all parts of the state. I know that it's a challenge to find sufficient funds. And right now, what we're finding as groups is that there are not sufficient funds to support the development and implementation of projects that are ready to, to be implemented. For example, sorry, would you say that I, you're, you're finding that there are not sufficient funds okay, for the funds. projects that yeah, groups are you. ready to, to engage in both for the project development of that work and then for the implementation of the project. So Justin, as an, as an example, apparently there were applications for over $850,000 worth of river corridor easements this year and only $350,000, $325,000 of funds available. So those are projects where the landowner is ready to go for a conservation easement on a, on a river corridor, which is an excellent way of protecting our resource instead of having to do restoration in the future, and those funds are not, not available. The same is true for riparian buffer plantings for the restoration work. Additionally, there's often, as I heard you guys talking about earlier, of non-capital dollars for important projects. For this year's March ERP round for the Ecosystem Restoration Project round, we've been told that DC does not have additional FY19 funds available for the non-capital projects. So that just limits the type of projects that can be done. <coughs> and not only are there not enough funds for these clean water projects, but one of the other challenges is that DEC is understaffed in terms of grants administration. And the DEC grants program and business office partners are capable, hardworking, and responsive, but they are <coughs> understaffed. And this is challenging because there are timing issues that impact water groups' ab ability to develop, design, and implement projects efficiently and effectively. So groups have recently been waiting up to six months to receive grant agreements. And these delays can mean missing key windows for field seasons and create challenges for nonprofits unable <coughs> to plan when funds will be available. Mm -hmm. We believe a more fully staffed DEC grants program would go a long way to improving efficiency and getting our projects completed on the ground. In addition, as I heard mentioned already, project development is really key. And sometimes the, the, that stage of a project is hard to fund. They are it's time intensive and hard to measure, which makes linking funding to outcomes a challenge. But without project development, priority projects will never get to the design and implementation phase. And we appreciate that DEC has started to recognize this, the importance of this work and has developed two, two new block grants this year where we'll be able um, WUB has applied for a grant through DEC and will be able to provide at least some project development funds directly to watershed groups and the districts have a similar grant for conservation districts. But we hope that this will expand in the future so we can get to the scale needed to be able to have the projects ready to implement. Um, I just want to be aware of your time. It's 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You guys walk out the door at 12. <laughs> that is That's the goal. Okay. So I just want to be aware of that. So I guess I will just say that, um, that so part of the challenge has been an uncertainty in, in, of continued dollars and types of funding available year to year, which has not allowed for consistent grant programs or timing of grant rounds. And but we feel that reconsidering funding mechanisms and funding project um, timelines could address all of these issues while in, uh, guaranteeing more on the ground outcomes. 
So I just wanted to mention, we've talked about tactical basin planning. I see that you guys have it up there. And so watershed groups have been important partners in developing and implementing tactical basin plans. Watershed groups work directly with conservation districts and with regional planning commissions and are often primary implementers of tactical basin plans. As the structure currently stands, conservation districts and regional planning commissions receive funding to develop and implement tactical basin plans and often rely heavily on the inputs and actions of watershed groups. While the NRCDs and RPCs are in state statute, watershed groups are still a key partner in this work. We have seen the benefits in watersheds where there is a strong, robust watershed group and tactical basin planners are strong with their input in the development and engagement in meeting goals. There has been discussion recently at the Clean Water Board to designate some tactical basin planning funds to watershed groups, and I would encourage the legislature to ensure funding for watershed groups' efforts in this area. And even beyond tactical basin planning, we believe that an investment in local capacity and local partners doing the work will go a long way towards accomplishing more on the ground work. I want to make sure you guys have a time for questions. I, I also was going to provide at least some thoughts on the distribution model moving forward. I have submitted some comments as part of the, the Water Caucus on some key issues that I feel would be really important for you guys to make sure are present in any funding mechanism moving forward. Sure, and I could just great. highlight a few of those if that would yeah. be and helpful. If, if, you, if you send uh, two, please, your written testimony. Yeah, absolutely. We'll make sure everyone gets it. So just as, you know, um, in looking at um, uh, the, the model that has been proposed, and I know that you guys have not actually um, come up with, there hasn't been a bill as far as I'm right. so, Well, there's a water bill, but it does not include that proposal. Okay. So okay. that is still circulating sort of out in the, the water world. Yeah. Um, but it's not a, there's no legislation. Okay. Well, I would just, just mention a few key points, and one is to make sure that, that whatever, which, whatever model is looking at the protection and of natural resources and the importance of anti-degradation that we want to make sure that we aren't only focusing our dollars where we have impaired waters, but also preventing mm -hmm. the waters of the state sure, from getting to that right. impaired right. point. And so I feel like that's one of my concerns if you focus only on um, looking at dollars per pound of phosphorus removed. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement there. Yeah. Good, then. I think. OK. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're really Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. And then um, just going to emphasize that all in and the need to protect all waters of the mm -hmm. state, um, looking at the Hudson as well, Absolutely. and the Connecticut, of yeah. course, and Lake Memphremagog and the Champlain mm -hmm. Basin, and just emphasizing that by sector and by region, that's been the message of the last few years, yeah. and we, we want to continue to see that. Um, and that just thinking about health of our waters and our watersheds, and that while it's important to focus on our TMDLs and our reducing our nutrient loading, it's also critical that the state protect other functions of our rivers, and that includes aquatic organism passage, flood resiliency, healthy riparian and in-stream habitat, and floodplain rest restoration and protection. And so it's just it, it feeling like it's really important that we think about things holistically, and that often when these are often achieving mutual goals, but we need to be thinking about it in a holistic way. Um, and then just also as we're talking about this, the as we're making decision, watersheds cross municipal and regional boundaries, as you all know. And so any regional efforts would be far more effective and efficient focused on watersheds and aligned with basin plans. And that overall, while we encourage regional collaboration efforts and can see the benefits of, in a regional approach to manage some clean water dollars, we believe that DEC has the technical expertise and that clean water funds that some clean water funds should certainly be managed at the statewide level. Many partners have worked over the years to coordinate and align work at the state level because there is value and efficiency in coordinating efforts across the state. But regardless of the delivery system, we will be most successful if the groups working in their communities developing and implementing projects have the capacity needed to engage in a full suite of watershed protection and restoration activities. 
So just some of those things to think about, and I can provide the full, yeah, very good the full remarks. You. But thank you so much yeah, for inviting yeah. me to speak, and I'd also be happy again. if you ever wanted to hear. I know that we haven't really had watershed groups ever come in and talk to your committee if you're ever interested in hearing more about what these projects look like, and they can share better than anyone on the complexity of some of those projects. We get, we get groups. I have a new meeting, so I've got a okay. Okay. So thank you, committee. Thank you, all our guests today. Uh, Excuse me. I'm having a healthy now.